Welcome to the NMEA Virtual Education Week 2020. My name is Matthew Zimmerman, and I'm the Vice President of Engineering at Farsounder. In this webinar, I'll give a quick overview of our products and walk you through our basic troubleshooting guide for navigation sonars. Established in 2001, Farsounder develops and manufactures 3D forward-looking sonars. Our products are installed on a wide variety of vessels, operating all over the world. Though we have a global network of dealers with Farsounder certified technicians, we've often found that a technician unfamiliar with our products may be brought on board to help troubleshoot a problem with the system. This primer is intended for anyone unfamiliar with our products to help them quickly and easily collect information on the status of the system components. Through this process, the technician on board may be able to identify the source of the problem and resolve it. If not, the information collected can be analyzed by Farsounder support team who can provide further direction. Our products are intended to provide the vessel operator with a clear picture of what is under the water ahead of the vessel. Farsounder sonars operate at navigationally significant ranges and can provide a complete three-dimensional image with a single ping. These systems can map the seafloor out to at least eight times the depth of water below the transducer module, as well as detect in-water targets out to the full range of the sonar. In this video clip here, we see the seafloor as well as a number of bridge pilings ahead of the vessel being detected by one of our sonars. The seafloor has its color mapped depth where blue is deep and yellow is shallow. On the left-hand side of the screen, we see our chart overlay display. Everything inside the sonar's field of view, i.e. the pie wedge, is real-time information ahead of the vessel. This display also includes a bathymetric trail to the side and behind the vessel. We call this our local history map. On the right-hand side of the screen, we see the same real-time sonar image ahead of the vessel inside our 3D sonar display. The user can rotate the image in 3D via a mouse or trackball, and a 2D slice through the 3D image is shown at the bottom of the screen in our profile display. The user can select any bearing they choose using the profile selector. That's the white plane shown in the center of the 3D image. You can learn more about the specifics of our software and using the sonar in our operation manual or by exploring the various training options available from Farsounder. Visit our website at www.farsounder.com or contact us via the email service at farsounder.com for more details about these training options. So why does a ship need a 3D forward-looking sonar? Well, the purpose of the sonar is to provide the user with the most basic navigation information, that is, what is under the water ahead of my vessel? Radar provides a picture of what's above the water's surface. Charts provide a historical picture of what was there the last time someone surveyed the area. Farsounder sonars complement radar and charts with a real-time picture below the sea surface. Along with the sea floor, our sonars detect navigation hazards such as rocky reefs, icebergs, large coral heads, submerged breakwaters, and floating shipping containers lost by cargo ships. We have three product models for customers to choose from, the Argos 350, Argos 500, and Argos 1000, which operate out to 350 meters, 500 meters, and 1,000 meters respectively. All three products offer similar capabilities, with maximum operating range being the primary differentiator between them. Each model consists of the same basic hardware architecture, with three different transducer modules optimized for their different range capabilities. Farsounder supplied hardware includes the transducer module, which is the sensor that is installed on the bow below the water, a black box we call the power module, which houses the system's power supplies and transmit signal electronics, and the sonar connection cable, which features an underwater wet-matable connector. 
This means that should the transducer module require servicing or upgrading, a diver can remove the unit without needing to haul or dry dock the vessel. I know this is possible, not just designed in theory, because I've done it myself. So here is a basic block diagram showing how the system components work together. The transducer module is installed in a fairing on the bow of the vessel. The power module is installed on board the vessel in a dry, weather-protected compartment. The far sounder computer, which performs all the sonar processing and displays the user interface, is installed on the bridge. Our sonar connection cable is used to connect the transducer module to the power module, and from there, standard Ethernet network is used to connect the power module to the bridge computer. If a customer experiences a problem with their forward-looking sonar, it may be due to a fault in the sonar hardware, misconfiguration of one of the components, problems with the network, incorrect interfacing to external NMEA sensors, or an issue with other ship systems that is adversely impacting the far sounder system. Our basic troubleshooting guide for navigation sonars is a great tool to help you identify the problem. This document is available on the dealer section of our website, installed on the bridge computer with our software, and also available by request from our service team. When following this guide, be sure to write down any measurements and observations along the way. This way, if you do need to contact Farsounder for further support, you'll have all your notes easily at hand. Space to write down these notes is provided in line with the step-by-step -step directions. Let's go through the basics of this guide together. The first component to investigate is the power module. Begin by exiting the software on the bridge computer. This ensures that the software is not communicating with the hardware and that the hardware should be in a known state. Then, turn off the power at the power module and wait for the LEDs to turn off fully. It takes a few seconds for all the capacitors inside the power module to fully discharge. Once the LEDs are fully off, turn the unit back on and wait up to 15 seconds for the hardware to reboot. At this point, you should see that the power LED is lit, the control AB LEDs are alternating with an AABB pattern, the ping LED is not lit, though it may blink once at power up, the TX off LED is not lit, and both banks 1 and bank 2 LEDs are lit. If you don't see this, the guide has further instructions on follow-up steps. The next component to investigate is the transducer module. Again, start by making sure the software on the bridge computer is not running, and again, turn off the power module. Next, open up the power module and measure the capacitance across the coax cable's BNC connector. The capacitance of the transmit transducer is about 2 to 2.5 nanofarads. The capacitance of the full length of cable is about 2.2 nanofarads. This means that the expected value for a full length of cable connected to the transducer module should be between about 4.2 nanofarads and 5.5 nanofarads. Note that some multimeters are not very accurate below 1 nanofarad increments. Therefore, your measurements might vary slightly. After measuring the capacitance, reconnect the coax and turn the power module back on. Be careful of the internal high voltages. If the power module is not powering on, check the AC mains coming into the unit. Many vessels have the power module on its own circuit with a dedicated breaker. Next, we'll check the power supply for the transducer module. Start by confirming that the yellow and orange conductors are connected in the correct position and the plug is well seated. Labels on the PCB indicate the correct position of the conductors. Measure the voltage across these conductors via the screw terminals on the connector. The expected value should be about 48 volts DC. Lastly, try pinging the network address for the electronics inside the transducer module. 
The best way is with a laptop or network testing tool connected directly to the sonar cable's RJ45 connector. The Argos 350 has one internal IP address, 192.168.0.2. The Argos 500 has two internal IP addresses, 192.168.0.2 and .3. The Argos 1000 has four internal IPs, 192.168.0.2 through .5. Of course, make sure that your laptop or network test tool is configured for the correct subnet. If your results are not as expected, again, the guide has further instructions on follow-up steps. Of course, make sure that your laptop or network tester is configured for the correct subnet. If your results are not as expected, again, the guide has further instructions on follow-up steps. The next portion of the system we'll be checking is the Ethernet network between the transducer module and the bridge computer. As you've probably learned by now, start by making sure the software is not running, and turn off the power module, waiting until the LEDs are fully unlit. Then turn power back on and wait about 15 seconds for the hardware to reboot. Now. Let's check the network through the power module to the transducer module again, this time from the network input at the power module. Unlike the last test, which only tested the network connection down the sonar cable, this will verify that the connection through the power module is also good. Depending on how your vessel's cabling is set up, there might be a convenient patch panel at the power module or you might need to open the unit and connect directly to the power module's PCB. Note that the power module's PCB acts as a passive Ethernet connection, no different than a standard RJ45 barrel coupler. This means that the total length of the sonar connection cable must be added to the length of the Ethernet cable from the power module to the bridge computer when considering maximum Ethernet hop lengths. Maximum hop lengths should not exceed gigabit Ethernet capabilities. For vessels with longer distances between the power module and bridge computer, a powered network repeater is required. The simplest solution is to use a basic gigabit network switch. Some larger vessels utilize a fiber bridge to span long distances, so you'll need to investigate the specific network architecture used and make sure that all hop lengths are within the specification of the respective hardware. Next, confirm that the network interface adapter on the bridge computer is set to automatically negotiate the network speed. The Argos 350 operates at 100 megabits. The Argos 500 and the Argos 1000 both require one gigabit speeds. As I mentioned a moment ago, on some larger vessels, the connection between the power module and the bridge computer is not direct. In such cases, check that any switches, bridges, and or VLANs are configured correctly. Lastly, confirm that the NIC on the bridge computer has a unique IP address on the 192.168.0 subnet. We generally recommend using .10 for the bridge computer but any address will do as long as it is unique. Again, if your results are not as expected, the guide has further instructions on follow-up steps. The final component to investigate is the bridge computer. As you probably expected, begin by making sure you're starting from a known state, confirm that the Farsounder software is not running, cycle power at the power module, waiting for the LEDs to fully turn off, then wait 15 seconds for the hardware to reboot. Now, start the Farsounder software on the bridge. We call this software Sonasoft, and there should be an icon on the desktop. First, confirm that the latest version is installed. You can check the currently installed version from the About option on the main Configuration Manager menu. Check the service bulletins on our website to see what the latest version available is. We'll be happy to get you that latest version if needed. Next. Confirm that the installed video card supports NVIDIA's CUDA processing and that the latest video card drivers are installed. 
Now, confirm the NMEA inputs from the ship's other navigation sensors. For best performance, the software requires heading, course over ground, speed over ground, position, echo sounder depth, and rate of turn. All inputs should be at 1 Hz, with the exception of rate of turn, which should be at 10 Hz. Next, confirm the connection to the transducer module via the software's status window. Each transducer module is calibrated at our factory in an acoustic test tank, and these calibration files must be installed with the software. If no calibration file is installed, then the software will notify the user with a warning. If you see such a warning, you'll need to reinstall the software. The software also requires a number of vessel-specific values that can be pre-configured in our software installers. However, you can confirm, and if needed, modify these values directly from the software. Make sure that these values are correct and let us know if you make any changes so that we can update our software installers pre-configuration values for this vessel. Next, confirm that the chart overlay functionality is working. If charts are installed correctly, you should see standard quality chart data. If you see low quality charts or no chart data, then this functionality is not configured correctly. In this case, you may need to apply a chart license and or install chart data. In the next step, confirm that the system shows energy being transmitted with each ping. Open the status view again to check the hydrophone data display. You should see a loud burst of energy at transmit with echoes fading out over time, similar to this picture. If the system is not transmitting sufficient energy, the status viewer will look more like this. Lastly, confirm that there are no excessive dead channels in the receive array. A dead channel will be represented by a dark brown square in the status viewer's hydrophone array, and when clicking on that element, no energy will be seen in the hydrophone data display. Because of their array sizes, our manufacturing tolerances allow for up to two dead channels in the Argos 1000, one dead channel in the Argos 500, and there should be no dead channels in the Argos 350. Like with the other components, if your results are not as expected, the guide has further instructions on follow-up steps. I hope you found this quick primer valuable, and that the next time you are on board a vessel with a Far Sounder 3D forward-looking sonar installed, you'll have a better idea of how to evaluate the system. Please don't hesitate to contact us for support. We'd be happy to assist via phone, email, or a remote team viewer session. If you'd like to learn more about the functionality of our products and how to best use them when underway, I encourage you to check out the training options and other training materials we have available. Thank you.